Welcome to the City of Chino Hills Emergency Preparedness Workshop. Um, this is something we've been doing for several years now, but because of uh, COVID-19 and all the craziness we're experiencing right now, we're doing this a little bit different. So we really appreciate uh, everyone that's joining us in this new format. Uh, it's a little new for all of us, so we're really excited to be here. And uh, hopefully we can bring you some great information. Uh, presentations today, as you just heard, are going to be recorded and they will be posted on the City of Chino Hills website under emergency preparedness um, once this is all completed. So you can go back and watch the whole presentation over again, or if you like, you can go to a specific presentation and, and see that again if you want. Uh, we're also broadcasting it on the Chino Hills TV channel as well, so you can tune in and watch it there. Um, tonight, we're gonna be going straight through all the presentations before we do any question and answer. Um, that, will become, that will come at the end of all the presentations tonight. So with all the information that you're gonna get tonight, if you think of a question that you wanna ask, make sure you write it down. So by the time uh, you're done here and everything we have to say, you don't forget what you wanted to ask. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So first thing I wanna do is thank all of our partner agencies that are here to do presentations with us. Uh, we of course have uh, the city of Chino Hills. We have the Chino Valley Fire District, uh, San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department slash Chino Hills Police Department. Um, San Bernardino County Department of Public Health will be joining us and Southern California Edison. Uh, Cheryl, at this time, do we have any dignitaries we'd like to recognize? Yes, we have council members on the line. We have Mayor Bennett, Vice Mayor Joe, Council Member Marquez, and Council Member Rogers. Excellent, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, glad to have all your support and glad that you're here to uh, participate with us. All right, so you're taking a look here at our webinar agenda. So like I said, we have several presentations tonight. Uh, first one is going to be myself talking about emergency communications. Uh, we have a great new program called uh, Community Connect with Chino Valley Fire District and Battalion Chief Joe DeSoto will be going over that for you. Um, we've heard a lot about all these rolling blackouts and power safety shut shutoffs. So uh, Jennifer Shaw from Southern California Edison will be here to talk about that. Um, with all those kind of power outages and, and things, we want you to be prepared. So Rod Hill, our Assistant City Manager is gonna talk about uh, generators and kind of demystify how to choose one. So that should be pretty exciting information. Um, we've seen California uh, is completely on fire right now. Luckily, uh, we're not there yet. So we want to make sure that just in case something terrible were to happen, uh, we're prepared. So Laura Addy, a sergeant from our police department is going to be going over Carbon Canyon wildfire evacuation. Um, then Danielle Barnes, our, uh, one of our fire marshals, will be talking about how to prepare your house and make sure that you're staying safe and prepared to prevent a wildfire from uh, affecting you. Um, if we come to the place where we need people to evacuate, we want to make sure you're prepared to actually go with all your val valuables and be ready to get out in a timely fashion. So I'm going to talk about go bags. And then uh, not only do we have our pandemic going on this year, but now we're coming into flu season. So uh, we're going to have Trish Muth Masayan from uh, El uh, San Bernardino County Public Health. She's going to talk about how those two things overlap and what you can do to be prepared for that. Uh, and then, like I said, at the end of that, we're going to have a question and answer session. Uh, there is some specific instructions on how you can ask questions. So when we get to that point, we will go over that with you. So you are prepared. All right. Once again, uh, my name is Christopher Freddy, and I'm the emergency services coordinator for the city of Chino Hills. And uh, we're going to start off by talking about emergency communications. So there's a couple different types of emergency communications we're going to talk about tonight. There's uh, personal communications, which is during a disaster, uh, how are you going to talk to your friends, family, community, things like that. And then the second uh, part of that is official emergency information. So things get pretty chaotic when a disaster happens. Where do you go to get the information you need on evacuations and different things like that? So personal communications, uh, just like with all emergency preparedness, number one thing is to have plan. Um, you can't just plan on winging it at the time. Uh, a lot of us here in Southern California have been through earthquakes. We've tried to make phone calls and the lines are congested. Uh, when you can't get through to your loved ones, that's really not the, the time to try and figure out how you're going to communicate. So you want to make sure that you have a plan ahead of time. Uh, you want to establish a rendezvous point um, in case you can't get a hold of each other. You need to make sure that everyone knows where they're going to go to join up and, uh, and gather back together. Um, you want everyone involved in your family to know if they have a specific action that they're supposed to do. 
Is somebody supposed to check on grandma? Is someone supposed to go straight to the rendezvous point? Uh, is someone supposed to communicate a certain way? You need to make sure that everyone knows what their job is before a disaster happens. Um, you need to know how you're gonna communicate. If those cell phone lines are flooded and you're not going through, what is your next alternative? How are you gonna get a hold of each other? Um, again, this, is, this all needs to be planned out ahead. Uh, and then you wanna have a specific response time. That seems a little bit weird because you know, right after an incident, everyone immediately wants to contact each other. But because of you know, maybe the powers out, um, maybe the, the methods of communication you're, you're using are spotty at best, you wanna make sure that you have a designated time where you're gonna reconnect with each other. Um, you wanna have an, a, a written emergency contact list. Um, you know, people used to have every important phone number memorized, but it's just not that way anymore. We all have it in our cell phones or other places. If you don't have a written copy though, and you run out of power and have no way to access that, then you're kind of going to be out of luck. So make sure you have a written copy somewhere. And then, uh, seems pretty obvious, but a lot of people forget this. You want to make sure that whoever's involved in your plan actually knows they're involved in the plan and have gone over all this. Uh, again, all this needs to be done ahead of time. Don't wait till uh, the disaster happens to try and figure things out then. So you can plan this out and be prepared. So there's a lot of different means of communication. Um, there's phone calls and texts. So we just said, you know, if, anyone's, if anyone has tried to make a phone call immediately after earthquake, chances are you're getting nothing but busy signals. What a lot of people don't realize, however, is that a text message uses far less bandwidth than a phone call. So chances are text messages will go through quickly and easily where phone calls will not. So make sure that that's a, an option that you think of. Um, another thing, especially if there's any kind of power outage, is you want to make sure you have kind of uh, various chargers, battery packs. We all use our phones all day long, so your phone may, may not be at 100% when the disaster happens. Make sure you have a way to charge it and a backup way to charge it. Um, I mentioned it before, but have your emergency contacts both in your phone and written down. Um, this is one that, that you sometimes hear of, but a lot of people don't think of. If you can, have an out-of-state contact. Uh, the reason for that being is that within our own net, local network, the lines may be flooded, but phone calls, cell phone calls will still be able to go out. So if you have a out of state contact that everyone in your communication plan knows about, they can all call and check in with that person and that person can relay information. So that's a really good way um, to stay in contact. Uh, landlines, you hardly see this anymore. And um, we're talking about corded phones like that uh, old school one up in the top corner there. Um, if there's a power outage, a cordless phone is not gonna do you any good. So make sure you have a corded phone. And that's if you still have a landline hooked up in your house. Um, if you do, seriously consider not getting rid of it because in an emergency situation, those will still work very, very well. And uh, the way things are going nowadays, if you get rid of it, you're not gonna be able to get it back. So if you have one, seriously think about keeping that. And the last thing is satellite phones. Satellite phones are excellent in disasters. Um, they use satellite communications, so no disaster on the ground is gonna affect that at all. Uh, but the issue with it is, is that they're, uh, they can be quite expensive. Uh, some of them do have prepaid calling cards and things like that, uh, but it is one of the more costly options around. So then we have social media. Social media is important for a lot of things. Um, so we're gonna talk about a couple different aspects of that. But um, email, for one thing, will work a lot like te text messages. The bandwidth is not as much, so you can send emails when you can't make phone calls. Um, again, this is all contingent on power still being up. But um, emails will be very efficient versus a phone call. Um, Facebook. Facebook is an excellent uh, way to post messages, pictures, things like that. Also, one thing a lot of people don't realize is that Facebook actually has a thing called Facebook Safety Check. Um, it's a feature that the Facebook company activates during a disaster, and it allows people to actually log in and click that they're safe, and it sends an automatic message to all of their Facebook friends. Again, this is not something you can go look at anytime you want. This only happens during natural and man-made disasters. Um, the company will actually activate it, but it sends out a, a mass message to all your Facebook friends to let them know you're okay. Um, Twitter is a great one. Again, you can send short messages to whoever follows you with pictures and everything else. Uh, Twitter is also, we'll talk a little bit later, but it's a great way to follow official information. Same thing with Instagram. Uh, GroupMe and WhatsApp are a couple things that are out there. These are chat apps where you can actually chat with your specific group of friends. So this is a good way for your communications plan to actually have maybe a family group 
where you can message each other back and forth. And again, the bandwidth is not going to be as big as the cell phone call, so it's going to go through a lot easier. Uh, there's also a bunch of other different emergency apps that you can download. Uh, one is from the American Red Cross. It's called the Emergency App. Um, you can look this up, and I'll, I'll have some information later on how you can access that app. Uh, that app has a button uh, that's called I'm Safe, and that button actually, once you log in and create your account and everything, when you hit the I'm Safe button, it sends messages out to everybody through all your social platforms. So it's a great way to let people know that you're doing all right. All right, next we have radio communications. So this is another alternative. Uh, whenever we're talking about preparedness, you always wanna have different means of doing things uh, in case one doesn't work. So there's a few different radio communications um, that you can get and they have their different ups and downs. So one of them is the family radio service, um, FRS. So if you're shopping for a radio and you see FRS, that's what this is. It's basically uh, a walkie-talkie. So they're, they're inexpensive, they're easy to buy, they're easy to program, they're easy to use. Uh, the downside is that even if it says it has a 40 mile range, chances are you're gonna get three to five miles range best, at best. Um, and that's all dependent on terrain, buildings, things like that. Um, so it is a good way to communicate, but you're not gonna get a lot of distance out of it. It also does not require any kind of license to use. Uh, citizens band, you know, the, the old thing you see, uh, Smokey and the Bandit talking on truckers, things like that. Um, usually mounted in cars, usually have big antennas. Uh, they're not great for handheld because they do require a larger antenna. Um, again, easy to use. They have a greater distance than a regular FRS radio. So that's a good benefit. Um, you can obviously only talk to other people that have it. Uh, and it also does not require a license. So that's another good option. Now a couple other things that do require a license would be a GMRS radio. And some radios that are out there have actually the FRS and GMRS uh, functions, so you can choose between them. Uh, GMRS is General Mobile Radio Service, and what this is is it's an actual little bit more uh, powerful signal going out. And a lot of the difference between all these is the frequencies they use, so I'm not really gonna get into all the technical detail of that, but you can do some research and find that out. Um, this does require a license to use, though, so you would have to get your uh, FCC license to be able to use that. And then the last one is amateur radio, otherwise known as ham radio. Um, this uses a series of repeaters, and depending on conditions, you can actually uh, reach throughout the world with it. Um, it does require a license, like I said, so um, it's, it would take a little bit of education. Uh, it's a great hobby to get into, um, despite or the, besides emergencies. Uh, and here in the city, we actually have our chart group, which is our Chino Hills Amateur Radio Group. Um, they meet monthly, they talk about radios, they'll help teach about radios, everything. Uh, and then they serve the city during times of emergency to help with our backup communications. So that's a great choice. Um, official emergency information. We have our wireless emergency alerts. So that's in that first picture in the top left there, that's what a wireless emergency alert looks like. An amber alert is a great example of that. Um, sometimes they, you get them no matter what. Other times you have to make sure it's activated on your phone to get it. Uh, but they are targeted locally, um, so you can get information about where you're at. It's uh, a really good information to get, uh, way to get information about different disasters and things like that. Uh, emergency alert system is the one you see uh, tests for on your TV all the time. An emergency alert system is actually a, a broadcast through radio and TV, and it gives you those, uh, you know, it'll have that, that annoying tone to get your attention, and then it'll deliver whatever the important message is. Uh, it's, it covers a little bit wider area than what a wireless emergency alert would do. That's more targeted. Uh, but again, another great way to get information. Uh, there's a couple new apps out for your phone uh, to kind of give you a little bit of an early warning about earthquakes. It's a matter of a couple seconds, but it gives you time to get away from windows, get under a table, thing like that. Uh, there's the Mike Shake app, which was developed out of Berkeley, and that's a statewide earthquake alert app. And then there's Shake Alert LA which is targeted more towards the LA County and LA City area. So uh, and those are both free to download. Uh, we talk about emergency radios, like the top right picture there. Um, it'll have AM, FM frequency, so you can listen to the news and things like that. But you also wanna make sure that you have a, a one that has NOAA, which is the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association. They're the ones that give all the great reporting on weather and emergency uh, alerts with the weather. Locally, um, we have things like message boards, uh, we had a picture of one of those on the on the very first slide. 
it's the big light board you see along the side of the street that'll give you uh, information about road closures and things like that. In any kind of emergency, we would deploy those with different messages about maybe um, evacuation points or uh, shelters, things like that. Some cities may have um, other systems like Nixle or Blackboard Connect. Um, you wanna find out whatever cities you're going to be in that you know what their system is and, um, and sign into it. So if you work in a different city or something like that, you wanna make sure that you're able to get alerts for the city that you're in as well. Uh, in City of Chino Hills, we have Notify Me, and you can sign up that through the city website. So if you go through the city website, this is what the homepage looks like. Um, if there's any emergency alerts in the city, that little red button that's being pointed at by the yellow arrow will be blinking. And if you click on it, it will take you to our emergency alert page. This is where you can sign up for Notify Me. Right there in the top middle uh, where the arrow's pointing, you would click on Notify Me. Uh, this is where you see all your alerts, also where you sign up. Once you click on Notify Me, it'll take you to this page. You can sign up for any kind of notifications about community events, anything like that. But what we want to talk about is specifically emergency alerts. So if you sign up through that, um, you can get emails and text alerts uh, from our police department on any emergency situations and on road closures, like when we have uh, all those uh, road work being done in Carbon Canyon. And then, of course, you want to follow all of the city's social media. Anytime we have any kind of uh, valuable or important information, including emergency information, it will go out on all of those platforms as well as our website. So you wanna make sure that you sign up on those so you have different ways of accessing information from the city. Here's some additional resources. Um, if you want, you can screenshot that really quick. Also, again, like I said, this will be up on the city's website later. So all that information will be uh, there for you at any time. And that concludes the emergency communications. Uh, next, we're going to talk about our fantastic new program with Chino Valley Fire District, Community Connect. Uh, good evening. Welcome to the Emergency Preparedness Workshop. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present. My name is Joe DeSoto. I'm a battalion chief for the Chino Valley Fire District. And I'm excited to announce a program that we've implemented starting September 1st. It's called Community Connect. And this is an online self-reporting program that allows us to protect our residents and their property in the most effective way possible. And the way we do that is by allowing the public to provide critical information that they deem is very, very important before an emergency. And so a lot of the questions that uh, come up are whether it's uh, safe and secure. And uh, I could assure you uh, this programming is bank level encryption available and it's only to first responders. So the Chino Valley Fire District First responders, the firefighters, are the only ones that really have access to this, um, it's this important information. And it's really uh, very, very simple. I like to say it's as simple as uh, one, two, three. Um, first, you need just to create an account. The account is free, so you can sign up. And uh, I'll, there'll be a little bit more information regarding how to sign up here shortly in the presentation. The, in, the second part is to enter that information uh, the, that you deem is the most important and that could be anything uh, as creative as you want to be. And there is some guidelines as well that can kind of guide you through that process. And then the final piece is updating your information when things change over time. Uh, some of the questions that have come up are, what if somebody moves? And we have it set in place so that every six months to a year, depending on how we set the set schedule, it'll send an email to those that have already submitted all their information and request that the information is still correct or if there's any changes and if we don't get a response back then that information we just deem it um, no longer uh, no longer current and correct so we move on from there um, but you have plenty of opportunities to change things as time comes on and then really the um, the most important critical piece of that is that we have that information available immediately as soon as you set up an account and put in your information and it's at the hands of the firefighters um, while we're responding to your incident uh, how do you sign up? Well, there's uh, several ways to sign up. Uh, most importantly, you create an account um, and you look for that. You look for that information from Community Connect on any of the fire districts web pages and social media accounts. Uh, you could also screenshot. I'm going to steal that from Eddie. I thought that was uh, very creative. Just go ahead and take a snapshot of that QR code as well as that um, Community Connect dot io forward slash info forward slash ca dash chino 
and what it looks like when you open up the page. This is uh, what we're calling the landing page. You'll see it says Chino Valley Community Connect. If you see in the right hand side of the page, the upper right corner, there's also a translation button. So it allows you to implement your information. Um, and it's got multiple languages that have been placed onto the program. And so you can utilize that. If you'll also uh, note the create your profile, that's where you kind of start the process. It's the blue button in the center of the page. And when you click on it, it's gonna take you to the register screen. And the register screen looks like this. And simply, you're gonna put in your email and then you're gonna create a robust password. And then you're gonna confirm that password. Again, uh, bank level encryption available. So any of that information, if you're concerned, is, um, is safe and secure. And then what kind of information can you provide? Well, again, it's uh, up to your creativity. Really, there's, uh, there's several several different ways of, um, several different things you can provide as far as the information goes. Anywhere from household functional needs, information about your pets, your people, and specifics about your property. Anything really that you think um, is important. And for, um, for some reason, I did a little demonstration, but my dog, my dog actually is a type one diabetic. And so I use that as the example. Um, if I wanted somebody to know that, I could note that. If I had a dog that, that tend to bite people or barked a lot and maybe was a, or was harmless. I mean, you might want to like put that information in as well. And then the final piece, really the most important piece for us is that the fire department, as they're responding to your incident, uh, we utilize this dashboard. I'm going to call this tiles. And this is just an example of uh, one of the members in our community. This is kind of what we see. I just have the highlighted piece. Um, I thought it was important and I think it's a really, really good example. A quick way in the house is through the garage and they've provided a code for us. Now I've obviously blanked out the code uh, for this presentation, but that's something that we would have access to only. And there's other um, very, very important information as well. In the fire service, we use what's called pre-plans uh, for many, many years. We have pre-plans that are associated with commercial buildings. And this is a way for us to actually have a pre-plan of a residence, which is a pretty amazing thing for the first time ever. It's a very, very new concept. Um, even though we've had pre-plans around for many, many years. So this is a really cool thing. You can see there's water shutoff locations, electric um, gas shutoff. Again, the sky's the limit. And so that's, um, again, really, really excited about the opportunity not to share, not only to share here this evening, but just to talk about the program. Um, so thank you. All right. Thank you, Chief. That sounds like a really great program. Um, I encourage everyone to sign up for that. That's really going to help uh, first responders, especially uh, our fire department, help serve the community a lot better. So that's amazing. Um, our next presentation is going to be from Southern California Edison, who is going to be joining us remotely. Uh, Jennifer, are you with us? I am. I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name is Jennifer Shaw with Southern California Edison. I'm your government relations manager covering the city of Chino Hills. Thank you, Eddie, and the city of Chino Hills for inviting me today. Uh, again, I, I would have loved to be there in person, but because of COVID, um, the situation has changed for us. Um, so uh, let's move forward. I'm going to present on the, our wildfire mitigation plan and our public safety power shutoff. I'm going to give you just some updates. I'm not going to go over every single slide here because there's a lot of slides. Um, and so, but I wanted to highlight a few things that um, have changed for this year and what we've done to improve the situation on public safety power shutoffs. And then at the end, I'll, I'll touch a little bit about uh, uh, the Cal ISO uh, rotating outages that we experienced uh, early in August. Um, so the, the slide that's showing right now, I think it's, it's page number two. I'd be remiss not to uh, reemphasize what everybody has been emphasizing this evening, and that's to be ready, right? This slide is from Cal Fire. It's to be prepared, to get ready, get set, go, have a plan. Um, with all these wildfires going on, uh, we just want to be prepared and have peace of mind. Next slide. The next slide is uh, talks about our response to COVID-19. I wanted to, to give you a highlight on that as well. Uh, we are an essential service, of course, and we continue to deliver safe and reliable service to our communities. Um, we have been prioritizing 
uh, critical work out there um, as necessary to protect our communities and public safety. We realized how um, impactful, especially now when everybody's working from home and, and doing school from home, um, how necessary and important it is to have power. Um, some of the programs that we've been enhancing, uh, just to let you know, is the medical baseline and care um, situation where might, you might have not been able to uh, qualify for medical baseline or care in the past. Uh, now we've loosened up a little bit the, the qualifications for that. So if there is a, a, a resident um, that needs help, especially with COVID-19, uh, financial situations have changed, please give us a call and let us know and we'll work with you. Another thing to really highlight, I wanna make sure people know there are a lot of fraudulent calls going on out there where people are calling our customers saying that we're gonna disconnect them for non-payment. That's not true. We're not doing disconnections for non-payment. And we're also uh, waiving late fees uh, because of COVID. So just to, to emphasize on that, don't fall prey to those uh, fraudulent calls. And then something to add, um, we've been investing in our communities by donating over a million dollars to local nonprofits uh, in response to the pandemic. And you can find out more information on what, how we've responded to COVID-19 by going to sce.com slash COVID-19. Next slide. I'm going to skip that slide. You all know we've been plagued with wildfires and it, this, the problem is worsening and it's getting really serious. And so um, at Southern California Edison and other utilities, we've put together a wildfire mitigation plan, which uh, uh, explains how the utilities are moving forward to mitigate that risk of wildfire. We definitely do not want our equipment, our lines to be causes for those fires. So. This is how we're, we're implementing uh, to mitigate that risk. Next slide. So what we learned uh, uh, that last year and what we're doing this year. So as far as, far as the public safety power shutoffs, again, we recognize the impact it has on customers. And um, we were working on multiple ways and to reduce the, the, the impact on customers. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing. But um, we noticed that last year we did, it was our first year to really implement PSPS and um, it, it worked. It, we found multiple instances where our equipment was damaged, um, our tree branches, uh, tree branches were contacting our power lines that could have uh, sparked a, an arc or, and, and caused a fire. So it's working and we uh, will continue to do a PSPS events. Now the next bullet points talks about the wildfire mitigation tools. We've been uh, hardening our grid, uh, installing high tech tools and technologies to help reduce the, the impact on the number of customers. And um, one of the things that we're really proud of that we were doing this year is we've been able to install equipment to sectionalize a circuit. So when before we had a circuit, let's just say it, it um, it caused a thousand customers on that circuit to be shut off. With these sectionalizing tools, we're able to minimize the impact of, on customers by sectionalizing maybe 500 or 200 um, that are only experiencing that outage. So we're, we're really excited about these new high-tech tools. We're installing them throughout the year. And uh, the next slide will show uh, how many of these we've been installing. Uh, another uh, bullet point here before we go on to the next slide, the customer care programs and communications. We're actively pursuing new programs to help customers. Um, and we've been improving our website. We realized last year our website was terrible and our maps were terrible as well. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work to help improve um, the amount of traffic that we can hold on these websites. And hopefully uh, we, that situation will not happen again. Uh, we've also been in contact with our stakeholders, community-based organizations, helping them uh, be prepared for these types of events and helping assist our vulnerable customers. Next slide. The next slide I'm not going to go over. You guys know the, the, the science behind these, um, uh, th this tool that we have on PSPS, so let's skip that slide. And then the next one talks about the three areas where we're focusing on on our wildfire mitigation plan, and that's hardening the electrical grid, 
for bolstering our situational awareness and enhancing operational practices to help mitigate for fire risk. Next slide. So here's what we've done so far. Um, we'll, we've installed wildfire cameras, 161 of them, uh, throughout our high fire risk areas. Uh, 850 plus weather stations have been, uh, will be installed by this year. Um, if you've noticed uh, increased amount of helicopter and drones around our high fire risk areas, we're doing inspections uh, just to make sure our equipment is up to par. Uh, we've insulated uh, wires or, or covered conductor, 650 miles have been installed, 1,200 more by the end of this year. And what that covered conductor will do is, is help minimize the, the risk of a line getting hit by a tree and then sparking an, an arc or um, uh, causing a fire. So this is really important for our mitigation plan and we continue to do that. Uh, the next box talks about our incident management team. We have over 500 plus qualified response team members that are on call 24 seven for any type of emergency. Um, and then our protective devices, that's what I talked about, sectionalizing uh, a circuit. We've installed over 12,000 plus and we'll continue to do that. Next page. Undergrounding, you all know what that is. Um, wherever in, in a high fire risk area, if it's feasible to do some undergrounding of the lines, we will do that. You can skip through that one. Uh, advanced wa weather modeling, that's a new state of the art software that we have uh, that will help us to uh, forecast weather down to less than two miles. So helping us to make the decision of, of whether to uh, enact the PSPS uh, event or not. And we have 24 seven monitoring of our own meteorologists and they help us decide on a PSP, PSPS event. Next slide. Vegetation management, I won't go over all this slide, but you've seen the increased, increased amount of, of uh, vegetation crew uh, out there uh, pruning back the trees, helping us clear those lines wherever there's a tree that might be too close to our lines, uh, we're making sure to mitigate for that. So you've seen an increased amount of that as well in our high fire risk areas. Next slide. Public safety power shut off. This is the, if you don't know what it is, uh, it's the de-energizing of power lines to prevent a fire, right? And we use this during elevated fire conditions. So just because we have a red flag warning doesn't mean we're going to shut off the power. There's a lot of things that go into that decision making process. Next slide. These are the decision points just to um, reiterate. Uh, the decision points are, are not limited to this. There's a lot of uh, facts that go into this, but we look at red flag warnings. We look at our own meteorologists uh, forecasts with whether they're forecasting strong wind conditions in that service area. Our own fire scientists will look and assess to see if there's fire potential, uh, weather and fuels. Uh, and we'll also send out crews to go out there and look at real time observations, whether there's hazardous conditions in the field. And they will feed that information to us as well. And then of course, we keep in contact with our first responders and essential services providers. Um, and we listen to see if, the, if there's impact to de-energizing those circuits and uh, that goes into our decision process as well. Next slide. Okay, so this slide talks about the ideal timeline and um, there's three new notifications that we've implemented for this year. The left side is what we've been doing. Of course, this is if, if, if we have enough time and there's the ideal timeline, this is what we strive for for communications, uh, four to seven days in advance, we're looking at the potential of a PSPS event. Three days ahead, we are setting up our incident management team. It's activated and ready to go. We are notifying our local governments, our tribal governments, emergency officials, and critical infrastructure service providers as well. Two days ahead, that's when the, the, the notification goes out to our customers. And then one day ahead, there's an update given one to four hours before a shutdown, we also communicate. And then the three new uh, notifications are when the power is being shut off, and then when we're getting ready to re-energize, and then when we're, we have the power restored. 
Again, this is if all things go well and we have plenty of time to notify. Uh, of course, you all know that you know weather can change within seconds or minutes, and we don't have enough time to uh, notify customers. And so uh, we appreciate the patience and. And this is what we strive for, is this is the ideal timeline. Next slide. So like I talked about before, our website improvements, uh, we have a dedicated page on PSPS. We have fire weather and PSPS information on there. We've increased capacity to handle the website visits. Uh, we've improved our maps. Uh, and then notifications, really uh, happy that we've added next door to the social media platform where we can notify customers um, in, in those local areas where we're activating a PSPS. Next slide, please. This is new. We have um, our customer care program and our uh, vehicles and resource centers. We've partnered up with cities when we have uh, public safety power shutoffs and we will deploy uh, community crew vehicles to have include uh, water, ice, blankets, solar power chargers, um, on-site phone charging as well. And that's an opportunity to talk to our, our employees out there with information on PSPS and, um, and other resources as well. So that information of where they're gonna be located and activated during a PSPS event is on our website. You can check that out uh, when there is a PSPS event. Rebates and programs that we've, uh, we heard uh, our customers last year, this is what the need was. And so we implemented these new rebates and programs. Uh, we have rebates for home, home energy storage. We have a $50 rebate for small appliance and device battery backup. Uh, a three to $500 uh, generator rebate for well water dependent customers. And then uh, for income qualified customers, we have a fully subsidized critical care customer battery backup. Next slide. I'll go through these slides. It's just how we've been communicating with our customers and with our communities. Um, because of COVID, we weren't able to do in-person uh, community meetings, but we've been doing them online uh, virtually. We've had a really good turnout on those, uh, those uh, meetings and uh, we will continue to do those as, as COVID persists. So next slide. Again, this talks about uh, reaching out to our vulnerable communities. Uh, next slide. Investing in our, our communities, partnering up with our first responders. Uh, next slide. The next one is uh, really, I want to emphasize our, our uh, website where you can give us feedback, se.com slash wildfire, our email address, our social media handles, and our customer support number. If you haven't uh, updated your information yet with us, please do so. You might have a new cell phone number, a new email address. Please do that. That is the way we're going to communicate with you. And, and you let us know how you want us to communicate. Uh, these types of informations. If you don't know if you're on a PSPS circuit, you can give us a call, we'll let you know. Um, and that's a, a great tool to use uh, to find out more information. And again, if uh, medical baseline, if you have equipment that you need uh, in order to, to uh, survive, uh, please sign up for a medical baseline. Let us know that you are a critical care customer and uh, that way we can have you on our system as that. Um, and again, check out our programs and rebates um, at our website, sc.com slash wildfire. Um, and then lastly, please be prepared. Again, have a safety plan, a preparedness plan. And there's also uh, a page there on uh, power outage tips. Okay, so that, uh, if you go to the next couple of slides, there's a, a slide there of useful information, those websites where you can find out more more information on, on what I've talked about. Um, and now I wanna just quickly cover the Cal ISO event. What in the world, right? <laughs> this was a few uh, weeks ago, back in August, um, the Cal ISO. So the Cal ISO, for those that don't know, is the California Independent System Operator. It manages the California electrical grid and the energy market for 80% of the state of California. Uh, we, SCE, Southern California Edison, we depend on CalISO to ensure reliable energy, and the most of the energy we use comes through CalISO. 
So before, uh, let's see, back in 2001 was the last time we ever had a rotating outage. Uh, between that time, we've had several flex alerts when we've had uh, you know, high temperatures, but uh, really that, uh, that month of August, that week was record-breaking heat. And so the Cal ISO called upon the utilities to reduce load. And so what we do first, they call the demand response programs, and that is like your summer discount program if you have, uh, if you're a residential customer and you have that program where we can cycle off the air conditioning, and in turn, we give you an incentive for that. So those are, that's a type of a uh, demand response program. So the Cal ISO told us to reduce load through demand response, and so we did that. And in August, August 14th, uh, that, that wasn't enough. I mean, there, there was record-breaking heat, and they needed more. So we needed to implement then on when they call a stage three, that's when we need to implement uh, the rotating outages. And so that's what happened back in August 14th. It was tough and we really wanna thank our customers for really stepping up uh, when we had uh, to call demand response and to reduce, you know, to flex your power and all of that, they really stepped up and, and we didn't have more uh, rotating outages uh, after that. So that was great because they were really thinking that we were going to have more rotating outages. So anyway, that is an update on the Cal ISO and um, that is all I have for tonight. So thank you. All right, thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, you know, with the, all this extreme heat and wildfires and everything else, um, SCE has definitely been on people's minds, so we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us and talk to our community. Um, will you be able to stay till the end for a question and answer portion? I will. I have a hard set at 8.30 or else I'll have uh, my kids knocking down the door. They want to go to sleep. <laughs> so yes, I'll be here till 8.30. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh, our you. next presentation is going to be on generators, uh, which is going to help you through these power outages and everything. So this will be by City of Chino Hills. Good evening. Thank you for joining our 2020 Emergency Preparedness Workshop. My name is Rod Hill, and this evening I'll be providing you a brief presentation on portable generators. Our, our presentation will touch on several key areas related to generators, which include a brief description of generators, key consumer considerations when purchasing a, purchasing a generator, the simple differences between inverter and conventional generators, common characteristics of generators by size, how to determine your wattage requirements, and finally, we'll highlight some important safety tips. Portable generators have become increasingly popular for the homeowner in recent years because of their moderate pricing, along with being easy to operate, transport, and store. Portable generators come in a wide range of power options which provide the consumers a variety of choices when determining the generator that best meets their needs. Portable generators use standard and easy to find fuels and come in a variety of sizes. Some have easy to carry handles while others use wheeled options. In Southern California, portable generators have frequently been purchased as backup power sources to be used in the event of unplanned power outages as were discussed previously. In recent years, we've seen events occur more frequently in Southern California, primarily due to energy demands exceeding system capacity and wildfire threats. In other parts of the country, power outages are commonly due to weather emergencies such as ice storms and hurricanes. And finally, camping after activities are another common use for portable generators. As consumers are considering a generator purchase, they need to identify what appliances and equipment would be critical to their household in a power outage. This may include things like refrigerators, cell phone chargers, lights, heaters, and medical devices. A good rule to remember is your generator capacity should exceed your identified needs by approximately 50%. Once the power needs are identified, a consumer can decide on the type of gener that generator that best meets, their need, best meets their needs. There are two types of standard generators, and they include inverter and conventional models. Differences between these models will be discussed later in the presentation. Finally, the purchaser should determine their fuel choices, and there are pros and cons to all sources. Many consumers are moving towards dual fuel options that allow the generators to operate on both gas and propane, and these are available at your common hardware stores and big box retailers. This slide is intended to provide some basic information regarding wattage requirements of common household appliances. A simple example of how to calculate your power needs is provided towards the bottom of the slide in red and includes the following calculation. An average household refrigerator requires approximately 1,200 watts. 
A flat screen TV would require 120 watts and five LED bulbs would require approximately 100 watts. Based on this calculation, the combined wattage requirement for these items would be 1,420 watts. Remembering that you should exceed your, your wattage uh, needs by approximately 50 percent, to purchase a generator to meet this needs would probably require a generator in excess of 2,000 watts. We'll move into the inverter and generator discussion, the inverter and conventional generator discussion. As mentioned earlier in the presentation, the majority of portable generators are classified as either inverter or conventional generators. The key difference is inverter generator, generator technology provides a stable electronical, electrical sound wave or sine wave that makes these types of generators uniquely safe for sensitive electrical equipment, especially those that utilize computer processors. Inverter generators are also commonly smaller and lighter than conventional generators. They are more fuel efficient and they're an excellent choice for smaller short-term needs. The inverter technology is most frequently found in generators up to approximately 4,000 watts. Lastly, inverter generators are generally more expensive than conventional generators, though, on a cost per watt basis due to their additional technology. Go to the next slide, Brandon. Thank you. Conventional generators are available in higher wattage options. They are frequently constructed of a strong steel cage. They provide a larger fuel capacity for longer run times. They provide an excellent long-term backup power source, but the possible downsides of conventional generators is that they are larger, louder, and heavier than their inverter counterparts. The next several slides will touch on information regarding the specific, uh, specific to the different sizes of portable generators. Small generators are available in options up to approximately 2,500 watts. They are usually an inverter generator providing clean power to sensitive equipment. They are lighter and easier to transport. They don't typically have electrical start or power or wheel options, and they uh, require extension cords to connect appliances and equipment. Medium generators are um, generally fall within three to 4,000 wattage range. They frequently use inverter technology, although there are a fair number of conventional models also available in these um, same wattage ranges. Many models offer both electric start and wheeled options for easy operation and transport. These models have capacity to power a variety of appliances, including small portable air conditioners. And the generators in this category generally also use extension cords for, to connect to appliances and equipment. And the third and last size category are the large generators that typically are in excess of 4,500 watts. These generators are usually conventional type generators. They, as you can see, they're usually a rugged design with wheels. And these large generators have the ability to sometimes directly connect to a house through an approved and permitted transfer switch connection. And our last slide tonight as we move through this uh, presentation is that we, uh, we definitely don't want to skip on safety. And we wanted to provide a few safety tips as there are inherent dangers related to uh, portable generator usage. Uh, we want to remind everybody to always read and follow the operator and safety instructions provided by the manufacturer. Operate all portable generators outside and away from structures. Portable generators can pose a variety of hazards, including electrical shock, carbon monoxide poisoning, burns, and fire. We want to remind everybody to utilize heavy outdoor extension cords whenever using the generator. Never attempt to directly power your house with a portable generator unless you have a permitted transfer switch designed for your generator installed. And remember to test your generator on a regular basis and peri periodically replace your fuel as the fuel fuels uh, deteriorate over time and it can cause you problems when you need to use your generator. This concludes my presentation and I want to thank you all for joining and we'll be happy to take questions at the end of the overall presentation. All right, thank you very much, Rod. Oh, skip the head there, sorry about that. Uh, so just a reminder, we will be taking questions at the end of all the presentations. Um, I know this has been a lot of great info so far. You may be getting overwhelmed with all the information, but like I said, this is all being recorded, so you can watch it all again, um, and it will be posted online by tomorrow. So you can be able to take a look at all these uh, PowerPoints once again, and um, you know, really look into some of the information that uh, we're putting out for you. Um, I also want to remind you that this is uh, National Preparedness Month, which is why we always have our emergency preparedness workshop during this month. Um, so hopefully uh, this really is making you think about getting more prepared and uh, you'll take some of this to heart. All right, our next presentation is going to be from our Sheriff's Department and we're gonna be talking about wildfire evacuations. Good evening. Sergeant Laura Addy here from the Chino Hills Police Department. Thank you for having me with you. 
Um, we're going to talk tonight about a couple of programs that we have, uh, the first being the Safe Return Program, and then talking about Carbon Canyon evacuation routes. So the Safe Return Program is a program that the Sheriff's Department came up with in 2016. And the Safe Return Program deals with uh, mostly family and personal emergencies, which oftentimes become a community emergency. So Safe Return deals with uh, trying to enhance our ability to safely return people who are at risk home when they leave unintended. Um, of course, when somebody leaves home and they have Alzheimer's, uh, if they have an autism spectrum disorder, dementia, Down syndrome, or any type of developmental or intellectual disability, um, it's always panic inducing and very quickly it becomes a community emergency to locate this person and return them safely home. studies and she calculates and she'll watch your every move and she's smart and that's one of the things about kids with autism I mean sometimes they don't necessarily express themselves but they're smart and so all it takes is just a, a brief second and you forget to lock a door and like I said we use a, a deadbolt and you have to lock it from the inside all it takes is just leaving your key on the counter or somebody you let somebody in, you forget the lock, and then there you go. We found out about the Safe Return program about 10 months ago, when the second day after we moved. Um, the doors were open and closed, and we didn't have our safeguards in place right. Uh, the time wasn't on the door, um, and I, I honestly, I don't know what happened. All I know is, is that, you know, we're unpacking, we turn around, somebody get a, a visual on Lydia. Um, nobody can find her, so we all, everybody get the kids out, we're going through the neighborhood, nobody can find her. Um, my husband, um, Brian, finds uh, some, a bicyclist who, right. who says, oh, are you looking for a little girl? Oh, she's all the way um, on church. The police is out there with her. So we get there as fast as we can, and she is there. Uh, a neighbor or a lady who lived on the street saw her, called the police, and She's in the middle of the street screaming her head off, and uh, there's about four officers there, you know, surrounding her. Um, and uh, when we finally got there and explained to them, because one of the first questions was, is, what is she on? Is, what's wrong with her? We explained she has autism and um, that she's just screaming because she does not ask her questions and there's a lot of stuff going on. So one of the, um, the, the deputies, um, a female, she explained the program to me and said that they have, there's a, I guess an elderly gentleman that they, uh, they watch that they had signed up for and, and she just advised me to do that. So after everything settled down, we got back home, I, I did it. I went to the website, it was very easy to do. Yeah, I did it, I did it straight from my iPhone. I, um, I, in fact, I didn't, I wasn't even sure that it even took because it was so easy. It was, um, few words about her, about us, uh, pictures. They told us to upload pictures. I did three. Um, and then it was done. And you know, they gave you that, you know, thank you, you're signed up. But, and that was it. Lydia wandered away again. And that was after she'd been signed up for safe return. And as luck would have it, she was uh, a deputy, I guess. I don't know if someone called, but uh, a deputy found her uh, about a block away from the house. And he was able to use the safe return database and found out instantly who she belonged to. So yeah, we were um, actually in bed watching right. a TV. I want to say it, it when close we got the call, it was close to nine o'clock. Um, I was from the Rancho Cucamonga um, Police Department. And our first question was, do you know Lydia Grayson? Jumped up out of bed, 
and ran to her room. And they said, we have her here. And so I ran to Brian and I said, uh, Lydia got out. We checked the door. Doors were still locked. Everything was locked, everything in place. We couldn't figure out how she got out. Went to the window, screen was out. She went through the window. Um, the, so they, um, she told us, oh, don't worry, she's here, she's okay, can you come pick her up? So we got out, we drove down to the police department, and she was there. Uh, to us, you know, safe return's really been a godsend. Um, parents like us, parents with, with kids with special needs, um, you know, it's added protection for us. I mean, a lot of these kids, they can't advocate for themselves. They may have communication issues. And to know that there's a program out there where they can instantly be identified and, and reunited with their families is just uh, is just incredible. Having that information in that database, we know that it's secure. Uh, we know that there are you know officers out there who are impassioned about trying to help. Um, and I would say that if anybody, whether it be you know whether you're the parent of a special needs child or Maybe you have an elderly adult uh, that has a that has a propensity to wander off. This is something that you definitely want to be involved in. It was super easy to sign up. Um, it's free, you know. And again, it's just it's just added peace of mind, you know. And we are very very thankful because again, we don't know what the outcome could have been, um, you know, when our own daughter got out, when Lydia got out. If it had not been for if it had not been for the program. We can't watch them 24-7. It's, it's, it's impossible. It, it just takes a second just to use the bathroom, to go answer the phone, anything. A lot of times we don't even know that they're gone. It's, uh, it's just great to have that extra layer, just to know that somebody else is out there that is going to take care of your kid as, as, as well as you would. So please, anybody out there, please, if, sign them up. It's easy. You'll be glad you did. Okay, so um, in our communities, we have a lot of elder people who have Alzheimer's, dementia, and we have a lot of um, youth and just adult age people who have these types of developmental intellectual um, disabilities. Uh, time is of the essence. Oftentimes, people will leave the home and they'll leave on foot. Uh, they'll leave without a cell phone, without a wallet, uh, limited ability to care for themselves. And this program allows us to search for them in a twofold way. Sometimes we come upon people who appear to be lost, uh, much like when Lydia was found in the street, and it enables us to search that database in reverse, locate them, and then locate their family. Sometimes, oftentimes, before the family realizes the individual is left. Um, and then on the flip side, if they leave the home and they call to report it to us, we're able to access the database quickly and get that information out to other responding and local agencies in the area to make our search even broader. So the Safe Return program is voluntary. Um, it, it gives us the emergency contact information, a detailed physical description, a physical address, a photograph of the individual, um, known routines and favorite attractions or places that they're likely to head, and um, special needs of the individual. Very easy to enroll. You can go to our website. There's step-by-step -step instructions. Uh, we do ask that you have a current or updated photograph of the individual, at least one. Uh, it has to contain just a single person. It cannot be dark. It has to have good lighting and color. And it cannot be turned or rotated sideways. This is the link here at the bottom. Uh, you can screenshot it or you can just go to the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department website and click on Programs and it's there under Safe Return. Um, the next topic we're going to talk about is going to be Carbon Canyon fire evacuation routes. So a lot of people who live in the canyon, this is uh, and, and commute through the canyon, we have a lot of people going through there, a lot of traffic. Um, in the event of a wildfire, what are the evacuation routes? It's very important for you to know what they are. Uh, first and foremost, it's important for you to know that if there is a fire in Carbon Canyon, the first thing that the police do is we get set up a unified command with the fire department. We work hand in hand with Chino Valley Fire to set up the best evacuation routes and to prioritize those. There's four evacuation routes out of Carbon Canyon. 
Uh, there's Carbon Canyon going into Brea, and then there's Carbon Canyon coming out into the city of Chino Hills. Um, going east and west out of the canyon, there's going to be Canyon Lane that goes out into Eucalyptus, and then Valley Springs Road comes out into Volano, and that turns into Woodview. We have a map here. This is going to be uh, Cannon Lane coming out of Carbon Canyon. Um, Cannon Lane can also be accessed through Canyon Hill that hooks up the Highland Pass. And this map shows you a couple of uh, points where we have a fire access gate here off of Cannon Lane going up to Eucalyptus, which is on the far right side of the screen. And then these community access gates that are pointed out here are internal gates that are set up um, in residential areas. This is the evacuation uh, route coming out on Valley Springs from the canyon. If you were to go up Valley Springs, you would come to a fire access gate, a set of two, and those would take you out into the Volano housing area, and eventually you would end up on Woodview Road. Both of the routes inside of Carbon Canyon, Cannon Lane and Valley Springs, are both secured by fire access gates. In the event of a fire, the gates can be opened by any Chino Hills PD personnel and fire. Uh, for the evacuation routes uh, on Carbon Canyon Lane into Chino Hills and Brea, we're able to coordinate traffic flows and shut down adjoining intersections to create one-way traffic to expedite traffic out of the canyon. So if we were using uh, Carbon Canyon into Chino Hills, we could shut down Chino Hills Parkway and create two lanes of traffic to exit the canyon. We recommend that all residents and commuters familiarize themselves with these evacuation routes. Um, the fire ultimately, ultimately the fire is going to determine which route we're able to use and which route's going to be the best to get people out. Have a plan with your family and especially neighbors who you think may need assistance. Stay informed by registering for emergency alerts with the city, fire, and with the sheriff's department. Thank you so much. Great, thank you very much, Sergeant Addy. Um, as she said, it's very important that you know uh, different ways out of your neighborhood and out of the canyon in general. Um, you know, she just pointed out to you all the different evacuation routes, uh, which is very important information to know. But also, like she said, you really wanna make sure that you follow all the official city accounts because once the decision has been made what the actual evacuation route is, um, all those notifications are gonna be pushed out immediately. So you don't want to just go ahead and choose your own evacuation route. You will be uh, given that information um, based on what the fire department and the sheriff's department know about where the fire is and where it's moving. So again, it's really important to know the information, but also look for the official information coming from the city. All right, uh, moving on with wildfire preparedness, uh, we're going to have our next presentation from Chino Valley Fire District. Good evening. My name is Danielle Barnes, and I have the privilege of serving as the fire marshal for Chino Valley Fire. Since the beginning of this year, wildfires have burned over 3 million acres in our beautiful state. That is one of the reasons why we are going to discuss a wildfire action plan. Chino Valley Fire encourages all residents, especially those that live in Carbon Canyon or within several miles of the state park or other open space areas throughout the city to follow Ready, Set, Go. Ready is about preparing yourself, your family, and your property. Set is about putting your plan into action and go is about leaving early when asked to evacuate. Our focus this evening will be on the preparedness piece or the ready component of the action plan specific to your property. Many might say that wildfires are a natural part of California's landscape and by the significant amount of ongoing wildfires we're seeing this year, can you definitively answer the question, are you ready? So what is involved in getting ready? There are two main components to protect your home. The first is defensible space. Defensible space is the required space between a structure, typically your home, and the wildland area. The goal of the required space is to create an adequate buffer to slow or stop the spread of fire to your home. The second component is hardening your home. Hardening your home is about taking measures to safeguard your home against direct flame impingement or embers caused by a wildland fire. It's important to note that homes permitted and built after January 1st, 2008 can have design features that are already in line with a hardened home. However, if your home was built prior to this, there are still things you can do. 
what's included in creating an adequate buffer. It involves frequently cleaning off your roof, gutters, decks, balconies, or property to avoid the accumulation of dead vegetation. If you have wood mulch within five feet of any structures on your property, you should change it out to non-combustible products such as stone or gravel. Remove all dead or dying vegetation within 30 feet of all structures or to your property line. Trim trees to keep branches a minimum of 10 feet from other trees or from your chimney. And remember to thin trees out to reduce their fuel load. You can consider planting fire resistant landscaping, but keep in mind that not necessarily, this is not necessarily the same thing as having a well maintained yard. Fire resistant landscaping involves using fire resistant plants that are strategically planted to resist the spread of fire to your home. Defensible space is vital to helping your home survive a wildfire. Chino Valley Fire has an active vegetation management program, and this includes annual brush inspections in Carbon Canyon, as well as our weed abatement inspections that are conducted twice a year throughout the entire district. We encourage all residents to actively maintain their property free of dead or dying vegetation. Please don't wait to receive a notice from our office in order to take action. Hardening your home. So we'll look at the roof. Chino Hills has required Class A roofs for about 25 years. So although you may have an existing Class A roof, you want to ensure that it is still sound with no holes, openings, missing um, tiles or shingles. Clear your roof of any debris, paying attention to the roof valleys, open end of barrel tiles and rain gutters. It's also recommended to screen your rain gutters or enclose them with non-combustible corrosion resistant metal covers. Eaves and soffits. To prevent embers from accumulating, you can box in your eaves or protect them with ignition resistant non-combustible materials. Vents. Prevent embers from entering into the attic or other concealed spaces of your home by covering vent openings with 1 16th to 1 8th inch non-combustible corrosion resistant metal mesh screens. Walls. Combustible siding or overlapping materials provide a surface and crevice for embers to nestle and ignite. If you have wood products such as boards, panels, or shingles as a siding material on your home, look to replace it with ignition resistant building materials such as stucco, brick, cement, or fire retardant treated wood. If you are unable to do so, um, re replacing your siding or upgrading it, be sure to inspect it for dry rot, gaps, cracks, and warping. You can caulk and plug gaps greater than 1 16th inch and replace any damaged boards, especially those with dry rot. Windows. Replace existing windows with multi-pane windows with at least one pane of tempered glass to reduce the chance of breakage in a fire. Doors. Install weather stripping around and under doors, including your garage door. Gates, decks, and balconies. Look to upgrade or replace with non-combustible ignition resistant building materials. And if your home has a chimney, remember to cover your chimney and stovepipe outlets with a spark arrestor. To give your home the best chance of surviving a wildfire, it takes a combination of both defensible space and hardening your home. Will you be ready? For additional information about the items presented this evening, please visit our website at www.chinovalleyfire.org or you can email our office at info at chofire.org. Thank you. All right, thank you, Danielle. Uh, especially with everything going on with wildfires nowadays, that's some great information for all of our people that live in the hills. So really take that to heart and uh, prepare your house and protect your property. All right, we're back to me. Again, I'm Christopher Eddy, uh, Emergency Services Coordinator for the City of Chino Hills. And continuing with wildfire preparedness, I'm gonna talk about uh, what to put in a go bag. Uh, and just a quick reminder, at the end of all the presentations, we'll be doing question and answer. So write those questions down. All right, your basic go bag uh, should be prepared for about a 72 hour period um, because you don't know how long you're going to be gone or where you're gonna be going. Uh, so make sure you have some sort of plan of what you think you're going to do if you need to evacuate your house, um, if you have a location to go to or if you're gonna be in a shelter, um, you never know exactly, but having a plan for those various uh, things will really help you out. Uh, you wanna make sure that you pack uh, seasonal appropriate clothing in your bag um, have that ready to go. Uh, a first aid kit, just in case anything happens along the way, you might need it. Again, since you may be gone from your home for multiple days, make sure you have toiletries, um, like toothbrush, toothpaste, that kind of stuff. 
because uh, you don't know when you're going to be able to get home and get more things. Uh, food and water, you know, that all depends on really what your plan is and what you think you're going to be doing. Um, if you're going to be out in the tent camping in a parking lot somewhere and you want to make sure you prepare for that. If you think you're going to be in the shelter, maybe bring just some snacks and things. But really uh, try to plan out what you're going to do. Uh, don't forget entertainment. It's not really a, a life-saving issue. But if you're stuck in a shelter somewhere for a few days, it might be really good to have a deck of cards or a book or something to keep you and your family occupied. Um, you want to throw in a flashlight in there. Those are just your basic things. But then you really want to remember the seven Ps of evacuation preparedness. So these are six of them, and we'll get to the seventh one afterwards. Uh, but the first thing is people and pets. You want to make sure that uh, you plan for everyone in your household to have a go bag uh, with whatever they're going to need individually to evacuate. But don't forget your pets. Um, you know, if you take your pets with you, which I'm sure you will, make sure you kind of know what you're going to do with them and make sure that you have supplies for them. Uh, a lot of times, especially when shelters are first getting set up and everything, you still need to care for your own pets. Um, if they have special dietary needs or medicines, uh, you want to make sure you bring those and also have any kind of vaccination or licensing records that you might need. All right, the second P is paper, uh, important papers. You want to have phone numbers written down, like I mentioned in my earlier presentation. You also want any other important documents, uh, which could be, you know, pink slips to vehicles, deeds to property, birth certificates, things like that, social security cards, um, things that are going to be harder for you to replace or that you, you know, may need along the way. Make sure that you have those things packed away, ready to go and easily accessible ahead of time. Uh, personally, I got myself a fireproof folder. It looks really good in the video. I'm not sure how it actually works, but it's good to make sure that you have all your documents in one place and that they're protected and easily grabbed to take with you. All right, the next one is prescriptions. Uh, this could include prescription medication, vitamins, eyeglasses, things like that that are not going that you're going to need when you're when you're out of the, the household that are also not going to be uh, easily replaced um, if you don't have vital information with you. Make sure you plan on that and have all that with you in your bag. Uh, pictures and irreplaceable memorabilia. If there's any kind of family pictures or heirlooms or anything that you uh, can't afford to lose in a wildfire, make sure that you plan on taking that stuff with you. Um, and make sure it's stuff that you can take with you. If it's, you know, too big or something, you're gonna have to figure that out. But jewelry, different family heirlooms, valuable pictures, things like that. Uh, you wanna make sure you have all your personal electronics, computer, hard drives, and disks. Those are kind of expensive and they have a lot of our lives on them. So it's good to take those with you. Um, a suggestion um, that I give that I also do is have all of your family pictures and maybe some of your uh, important documents and all that backed up on a hard drive. In case, in case you lose the paper copies, you still have it and it's not lost forever. So make sure you think about things like that. The last one is plastic. Make sure you have your credit cards, ATM cards, and cash. Um, once you're displaced from your home, you never know what situation you're going to be in and uh, money is always a good thing to have. In a major disaster situation where there could be power outages and other things, cash is very important to have and you may want to think about having small denominations because in a serious situation, uh, when you go to the local liquor store and it's the last bottle of water and all you have is a $100 bill, uh, guess how much that bottle of water is going to cost you? It's going to cost you $100 because they're going to say they can't make change, um, you know, the cash registers down, whatever. So think about keeping small denominations with you too for things like that. Um, like I said, this is the six P's, but we threw in a seventh P that we think is very important, and that's your phone. Everyone lives on their cell phone nowadays. Talk about having pictures backed up and everything else. Most of our pictures and videos and everything else live in our cell phones nowadays. So you want to make sure that you have your phone, but also you want to make sure that you have a way to keep that phone running through whatever it is. So you want to make sure that you have wall charger uh, to be able to plug it in wherever you go, have a backup, always have backups of everything. Uh, make sure you have a car charger so you, as you're driving wherever, you can charge your devices. Uh, make sure you have extra batteries or power banks and you have a couple options there pictured. Um, any way to keep your phone alive and running. Uh, and then make sure you have cables and backup cables. Make sure they're the appropriate cables for the devices you have. And if you're a real nice person, bring cables for phones you don't have so you can share with other family members and friends. Uh, but I can't stress how, how important this is. 
This will be a communication lifeline for you. It will be a backup of data, things like that. It will also be an important tool for accessing emergency information as we talked about um, earlier. So make sure you really consider that. All right, and that is a basic go bag. Moving right along, we are going to have our last presentation before question and answers. And this is gonna be from Trish Muth Masayan, and she is from San Bernardino County Department of Public Health. Thank Go you guys. It. Thank you guys so much for having me today um, in such an esteemed and beautiful room. It's great to be here. So my presentation today is on advanced planning, flu season during a pandemic. Again, my name is Trish Muth Masayan. My usual role with the county is a medical emergency planning specialist. During the course of this pandemic response, I have been working on testing and coordinating all of our single day testing events throughout the county. Right now I do work out of the Emergency Operations Center and it's been a wild ride this year. <laughs> this presentation does focus on flu season and what that means for us. Looking back in 2018 and 2019, we did have some elevated numbers of flu, of flu and influenza-like illness or ILI symptoms present throughout our county. In 2018, we did have a pediatric death that occurred in our county. Usually during flu season, my department, the Preparedness and Response Program associated with San Bernardino County Public Health, host mass vaccination clinics or MVCs. We use these clinics as an opportunity to test some of our emergency response plans and procedures. We use them as an opportunity to A, give back to our community members with a free flu shot uh, available to all of our community members who are age three or older. And we also use that as an opportunity to test our medical point of dispensing site plans. In 2019, during flu season, we started hearing about the first reports of coronavirus in China during the height of flu season, right at the end of November and beginning of December. We experienced very elevated numbers of ILI-like symptoms throughout our county. And looking back, it is now clear that some of that could have been due to the coronavirus being present in our county before we really knew it was occurring. These graphs right here will show you, I'm going to explain them very briefly. This red line that's jagged shows 2020. All the other lines underneath are pretty consistently close together. That's what was happening previously. The blue line is 2019, which still shows elevated numbers, especially at the beginning of flu season for these symptoms. You can see it dips and then goes up again. Where the red line ends around week 34, week 35, marks where we are presently in our flu season. We have seen a dip recently. However, that does not mean that we're out of the woods quite yet when it comes to either influenza or COVID-19. We do not know yet what will occur throughout the remainder of this flu season. However, we are planning much more in order to prepare and to ensure our community safety during this time. The table on the right shows a little bit more in depth. The first column is 2019 to 2020, and then it goes over from there. So if you'll look in parts, especially at the beginning of our flu season, our ILI numbers were inflated almost 300% from the year prior. Looking forward, influenza this year. Flu season traditionally starts around October or November. We've seen very, very elevated numbers this year already. But what does that really mean? If you're positive for the flu, that puts you at higher risk to be positive for COVID-19 and vice versa. It is possible to be co-infected with both influenza and COVID-19. What does that really mean for our highest risk individuals in our county? What that means is we can expect elevated numbers of hospitalizations, 
a higher impact on our healthcare system, as well as a higher impact on our most vulnerable community members who may not have health insurance or may have difficulties in accessing healthcare services throughout our county. On the right of this slide, you can see the symptoms associated with COVID-19. And what I really want to point out here is that many of these symptoms are also associated with influenza. The best way to know if you have COVID-19 is to get tested. The best way to protect our most vulnerable community members from COVID-19 is to get tested. One other thing that I really want to highlight here and mention is that many carriers of COVID-19 are in fact asymptomatic, which means that they are not showing symptoms for COVID-19. However, they can be carrying it and potentially transmitting it if they're not careful, if they're not following our social distancing measures, if they're not wearing their masks in public, if they're being a little bit lax, one other thing that I really want to highlight here is that a negative result for COVID-19 does not mean that you're out of the woods. You can be re-exposed to COVID-19 almost immediately upon leaving a testing site or venturing back out into the public again. We're relying on everybody in our county to remain vigilant and help us keep flattening the curve. We've seen our number of cases go down and we want to keep it that way. What I really want to impress upon you all is that if it's possible to stay home as much as possible, follow our health officer's orders, wear that mask, sanitize your spaces, that is the best thing that you can do to protect yourself, your family members, and our most vulnerable populations. Many of the comorbidities that make you high risk for both influenza and COVID-19 are the same. A comorbidity means that you could have high blood pressure, you could have cardiovascular issues, you could have diabetes, you could be a smoker. Many of those things are prevalent, especially throughout our more vulnerable populations in this county. Advanced planning, what are we doing to work on this? Number one, get your flu shot. They are already available at many, many pharmacies and with your providers. The San Bernardino County Department of Public Health will be distributing free flu shots starting October 2020. I will be sharing all of those dates with City of Chino Hills to make sure it's easily accessible for this entire community here. We are recommending that high-risk individuals get that vaccine as soon as possible, either from their provider or from another avenue where they can receive that, such as one of those pharmacies listed above or listed on this slide. Our COVID-19 vaccine may be available as soon as mid-November. There was another news report from CBS this morning forecasting that it could be here as soon as November. What that means for us is that we are using this flu season and our mass vaccination clinics or our medical point of dispensing sites in order to practice to distribute that vaccine to our community members. Right now it looks as though there will be two doses of the COVID-19 vaccine, either three or four weeks apart, followed by an observation period. The reason for that observation period is that we will want to ensure, since this is a new vaccine, our community members' safety. If there is an adverse reaction to any of the vaccines, we want that to occur while our medical staff are present and while we have the ability to care for them or call emergency medical services if needed. One final reminder, you should not have any symptoms when you receive any vaccine. The vaccines contain live elements of, of either type of virus that could put you at higher risk for developing further symptoms if that is the case. Our medical point of dispensing sites are thrown up in non-traditional clinical settings such as schools, senior centers, community centers, um, 
pretty much anywhere, we can throw one of these up and we can dispense vaccines or we can dispense prophylaxis and or medical countermeasures. Prophylaxis means a life-saving medical countermeasure. That could be anything from a vaccine. It could be antibiotics. In the case of H1N1, back in the day, it was Tamiflu to start. Like I mentioned earlier, we are using these mass vaccination clinics this year as a great opportunity to test our emergency preparedness plans. We do this every year. However, this year we have developed some slight adjustments, both at the re recommendation of the State Board of Pharmacy and California Department of Public Health. Another exciting thing for us this year is we will be hosting our first ever drive through MPOD or medical point of dispensing site. All of these dates, times, locations will be coming soon to both our SB COVID-19 website, the public health website, and will be shared with all of our city partners, including City of Chino Hills, to make sure that you guys all have the knowledge on how you can receive these free flu shots. We do not ask for insurance. We do not check identification. They are available to anybody who does not have a symptom at that time or is over three years of age. We want to make this accessible to our community members and ensure that the word gets out there. We also still are currently operating our SPOCs or our specimen point of collection sites. Our current vendor is Fulgent Genetics. We offer free COVID-19 testing regularly. Right now they are operating Monday through Friday and we have some single day events occurring on Saturdays or Sundays and you can access that information on our website. Some of our events will actually be concurrent with both testing and vaccination taking place at the same time. If you are interested in any of those, on my next slide, I have QR codes here as well as the links. If you do not know how to use the QR codes, you essentially focus your phone camera on this QR code. A link pops up at the top of your screen and you can click on it to go ahead and visit there. If you're looking from your computer, feel free to type those websites in. And that about wraps it up for me. Thank you so much for your time and thank you to City of Chino Hills for having me here tonight. All right, thank you very much, Trish. We appreciate your ongoing partnership with the city. Um, Trish helped us run a um, COVID-19 testing site at Chino Hills High School, which was a fantastic success. So we really appreciate our partnerships with you. And large thanks to you, Chris, and also to Sheriff, who was out there helping us that day as well, and to Fire, who came and assisted. So, you know, it really is a collaboration and a partnership when it comes to any type of emergency. So we couldn't have done it without you guys either. Thank you very much. All right. Um, we are to that point. We have made it through. There was a ton of information, as always. Uh, really great presentations. I want to, again, thank you to all of our presenters for being here. Um, we will open up for questions now. I know uh, Jennifer Shaw is only gonna be able to be on for a while from uh, Southern California Edison. Um, I will say at this point, my contact information will be at the very end of tonight's presentation and you can uh, email me with any questions and I can forward them to Jennifer and get them answered for you. Uh, Cheryl, would you like to explain how people can ask questions, please? Sure, if you wish to make a comment tonight, please raise your hand within the Zoom application and you'll be called upon when it's your turn to speak. To raise your hand from a phone line, just dial star nine. In the Zoom application, when I unmute your line, you'll receive a message asking you to unmute your microphone. Just click on the unmute now and that will make you live. I do have a couple hands raised if you want me to go ahead. That was the first yeah, question. please, let's get it started. First, we will um, unmute Jennifer McDermott. Hi, Jennifer, whenever you're ready, go ahead and ask your question. I'm gonna click on the unmute again to give her that message. Okay, we'll move past Jennifer and then we can go back to her. Uh, the next one is a phone line. The last three digits is 558. I do not have a name for it, so. 
Okay, go ahead and ask your question, please. Hi, good evening. I was just curious to know if the city of Chino Hills had a community resource uh, center agreement already intact with Southern California Edison in case of a public safety power shutoff. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that, but we are in constant contact with Southern California Edison. Um, we get alerts on a regular basis from them uh, when they're doing shutoffs and in what area. Um, it is the same alerts that they send out to the customers. And as soon as think, we get I'm that sorry, information, I think we, you misunderstood my question. Um, sure. When the gal from Southern California Edison was speaking, she said that there is a CRC agreement that cities can have in it. So when there is a power, um, a public safety power shutoff, individuals can go to a certain location and get ice, water, air conditioning, plug in, those types of things. So I was just curious if the city of Chino Hills has one of those agreements or would Chino Hills residents have to go to another location because that wasn't specified during the presentation. Yeah, and this yeah, is- Yeah, okay, I got what you're saying. Uh, can you hear right, me? Go ahead. This is Jennifer. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for Jennifer. That. Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, we, we do have uh, contracts with cities. Uh, I'm not aware that we have one with Chino Hills yet, but I will check with the business customer division to see if we do have one in place with Chino Hills. However, we do have the community resource vehicles that we will deploy out when we know there is a PSPS event in a particular city. So those are available and they have the same type of information that a community resource center would have. Um, and then again, if, if we don't have something in place, we will work with the city to get something in place. Uh, in addition Thank to that, you. Jennifer, I do know that we've talked about that before. Uh, but I'm not sure that we finalized anything either. So if you could check on that, uh, get back to me. Yep, we'll do. Um, Thank that'd you. That'd be a great idea. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to call out for Jennifer McDermott again. Um, I'm trying to unmute her line. Jennifer? I'm sorry, I didn't have a question. <laughs> sorry. That's okay, Jennifer. Go ahead and ask your question. Oh, no, I didn't have a question. I, I might have hit something by accident. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. No problem. Well, thanks for joining us. <laughs> thanks. It's been interesting. <laughs> thanks so much. <laughs> okay. We do not have any other hands raised, so if we just ask one more time, if you wish to speak, uh, or ask a question, go ahead and raise your hand in the Zoom app or dial star nine to do it during the phone call. We do not have any other speakers. No questions. All right. Well, if there's no further questions, uh, I just want to take a moment to thank our city council for supporting our um, ongoing emergency preparedness efforts. Uh, they love to see us do events like that, and we really appreciate all the support that they give us. Um, and I want to thank the community at large for uh, constantly participating. Whenever we do anything like this, we get great response from communities. We always have a good turnout. Um, so we really appreciate all the residents' uh, interest in emergency preparedness and bettering our community. Um, and lastly, thank you again so much for the panelists and for everyone help that helped to put this webinar together. Um, it turned out great. This is our first time trying this for our emergency preparedness thing. So. Uh, I'm really happy and I hope everyone learned something. So thank you, have a great evening. Um, and as I promised, oh, I almost forgot. Don't forget, October 15th, 2020 at 1015 at 1015 AM, make sure you participate in the great shakeout. Uh, it's always important to practice your earthquake drills. So whether it be at your work, with your family, your friends, whoever, make sure you uh, practice. And lastly, I promised I would have my contact information there you go. Um, if you have questions about anything, feel free to reach out to me and the presentations will be posted on the city website tomorrow. So thank you, have a great evening and stay safe.